On the 18th of November, 1755, there was a riot at David Garrick's Theatre Royal in Drury Lane caused by a ballet. With cries of no French dancers, a crowd smashed up the scenery of the Chinese festival, a ballet created by the up-and-coming young French choreographer Jean-Georges Nevers. A mob even proceeded to Garrick's house and smashed up the windows. This happened in London, where enlightened ideas were being discussed at the Royal Society, in coffee houses and at salons uh, of a network of intellectual women. It was the London of painters like William Hogarth and Joshua Reynolds, and writers like novelist Henry Fielding and historian Catherine Macaulay. In 1756, the year after the riot, Garrick's old friend and mentor Samuel Johnson finally published his famous dictionary, and Benjamin Franklin arrived from Philadelphia for his second prolonged stay. It's easy to dismiss the events surrounding the Chinese festival as a row about a superficial piece of decorative Rococo whimsy. My argument in this video is that the theatre route has more to do with enlightened thinking that th than this suggests. The Chinese festival was presented as an afterpiece, a lighter entertainment following a play which was the main focus of the evening's programme. On the opening night, Despite the presence of King George II in the royal box, there had been shouts of no French dancers. France and England had been at war four times since the end of the 17th century, that's 1689 to 97, 1702 to 13, and 1743 to 48, and the year after the riot saw the opening engagements of the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 63. Hostility against the French in general, and French culture and fashion in particular, was complicated by class allegiances. In this case, the gentry and nobility who were seated in the boxes and in the amphitheatre, that's the dress circle, wanted to see the ballet. The prosperous tradesmen and members of the professional middle class, seated in the pit, that's the stalls, were against the ballet. Hostility between those in different classes led to arguments and to more and more serious fights breaking out over the run of the ballet. The nobility believed they were entitled to have their tastes catered for and to impose these on everyone else, while the middle class audience members became increasingly vocal about their patriotic objections to what they saw as the corrupting French influence on British culture. In retrospect, their anti-French feelings appear as almost an ancestor of the xenophobic national populist politics that in the 21st century led to Brexit. While the riot in 1755 was not the only theatre riot in 18th century London, it was the worst, Garrick apparently losing £4,000 because of it. So why did bringing Nevers' ballet over from Paris have such catastrophic consequences? What lay behind the fighting? To begin to answer these questions, we need to look at the ballet itself, which began in France as Les Fêtes Chinoises. How did it come to be shown in London? And what do sources about the disturbances reveal about anti-French feelings and cross-class antagonism? The ballet production that Garrick imported had drawn Le Tout de Paris to l'Opéra Comique in Paris in June 1754, that's the year before. In his book on Nevers, Derek Lynham translates a description of the ballet from a 1769 book about l'Opéra Comique. Here's the description. The stage represents in the first instance an avenue ending in terraces and steps leading to a palace on a height. This first scene, it seems to me it's probably a drop curtain, changes and uncovers a public square decorated for a festival with, in the background, an amphitheatre on which are seated 16 Chinese. By a quick change of positions, instead of the 16 Chinese, 32 are seen on the gradin, at the stepped piers, going through a pantomime. As the first group descends, 16 further Chinese 
both mandarins and slaves, comes out of their habitations and makes their way to the gradans. All these form eight rows of dancers who, rising and dipping in succession, imitate fairly well the billows of a stormy sea. So that's 48 dancers, all in new Chinese costumes, creating clever, playful theatrical illusions through dancing. Uh, the description goes on. All the Chinese, having descended, begin a character march. There are a Mandarin born in a rich palanquin by six white slaves, while two Negroes draw a chariot on which a young Chinese woman is seated. They are preceded and followed by a host of Chinese playing various musical instruments. This march concluded, the ballet begins and... and leaves nothing to be desired, either in the diversity or in the neatness of the figures. It ends in a contradance of 32 persons whose movements trace a prodigious number of new and perfectly designed attitudes which form and dissolve with the greatest of ease. At the end of the contradance, the Chinese return to their place on the amphitheatre, which is transformed into a china cabinet, 32 vases which rise up, concealed from the eyes of the spectators, the 32 Chinese one saw before. The scene changes described here would have made use of 18th century stage machinery with ropes and windlasses not unlike a sailing ship from the period. Here's examples of this from the miraculously surviving 18th century theatre in Drottlingholm Royal Palace outside Stockholm. Derek Lynham comments that Les Fêtes Chinoises was a full-length dance spectacle, commanding interest because of the groupings, the pattern of its dances, and the picturesqueness of its settings and costumes." Unquote. Too often a ballet at the time was a random assemblage of divertissement danced in a hodgepodge of recycled costumes. Nevers Ballet, however, had a, quote, integrated conception of decor, costumes, properties and movements subordinated to the development of a stage picture, unquote. Nevers is now remembered as a modernising influence on 18th century ballet and for his 1760 book Letters on Dancing and Ballet. Les Fêtes Chinoises also drew on an emerging fashion for chinoiserie. As a result of 200 years of Jesuit missions to China, and visits by other Europeans, there was a lot of information about China available in Europe by the 1750s. Confucius's writings had been translated into French, and there were drawings and paintings of Chinese architecture and authentic costumes worn at the Qing court in Beijing. As Peter Kitson notes, China was both a symbol of imperial excess and of Confucian moderation, alternately a threat and an aspiration. Unquote. While some theatre productions seriously engage with Chinese philosophical ideas, Nevers' festival can only be described as offering audiences quote, the fantasy world of decorative Rococo whimsy. Unquote. The fact that the roles included white and black slaves shows how little knowledge or interest Nevers and his collaborators had about the actual conditions of Chinese society. What the ballet's chinoiserie offered was an exotic alternative to the strictures of a more conservative classical high culture. What can we guess about why Garrick brought the ballet to London? He was probably interested in ballet th through his wife, Eva Marie Weigel, who had trained as a ballet dancer at the court in Vienna under the ballet reformer Franz Anton Hilverding. Garrick knew Jean Monnet, the French theatre manager at L'Opéra Comique, where Les Fêtes Chinoises had been produced. Monet had unsuccessfully tried in 1748 to present French comedies on the London stage, losing money in the attempt. Garrick helped him out by holding a benefit performance for him, which raised £100. Garrick perhaps also saw a gap in the market for ballet performances because the King's Theatre in Haymarket, which had a licence to present ballet and opera, was in some financial difficulty and was presenting less performances than usual. 
chinoiserie was becoming fashionable in London. Architect Sir William Chambers, who had visited China, published his Designs of Chinese Buildings, Furniture, Dresses, Machines and Utensils in 1757 and designed the Great Pagoda in Kew Gardens in 1761. Garrick produced and starred in The Orphan of China in 1759, based on a 12th century Chinese play. Unlike the Chinese festival, the play was a success. This suggests that the Chinese setting of the ballet was not in itself a problem. It was its French origin that was bringing about increasing polarisation between the upper and middle class members of the audience. At the fifth performance on Saturday the 15th, because the Lords went to see an opera, the rest of the audience rioted and began to smash up the theatre. They only stopped when the management announced that there would be no more performances of the ballet. On Monday the 17th, the Lords and their followers were back and demanded that the ballet be presented again on the Tuesday. In response to shouts from the pit, some lords jumped down into it with drawn swords and threatened to kill a protester, whereupon Garrick himself jumped down from the stage to intervene, claiming that their victim was his friend. He may actually have been a personal friend, but an actor-manager in a venue like Drury Lane Theatre needed to foster the idea that all the audience were his friends. The location of Drury Lane is significant here. It is to the west of the City of London, where merchants and clerks lived and worked, but to the east of the West End, where the nobility and fashionable gentry stayed when in London. To be economically viable, Drury Lane Theatre would have drawn on both and needed to keep them all happy. Divisive reactions to Nevers' ballet threatened to undermine Garrick's ability to foster common ground between different social groups in the audience. Some members of the nobility were strongly Francophile. For example, Lady Mary Harvey was a key connection between salons in London and Paris, spending much of her time living in France. She was an old friend of Voltaire's and knew d'Alembert, and was close to many French aristocrats. English nobles and gentry were avid consumers of luxury imports from France. A satirical print from 1757, the second year of the Seven Years' War, shows the arrival from France of people and produce at Customs House Quay in the London docks. A street kid holds his nose as an open barrel of what looked like camembert cheeses, while there are crates of perfume, of ribbons, tippets, muffs and gloves, and barrels of French wines. A French ballet dancer is enthusiastically embraced by a fashionably dressed Englishwoman to the amusement of her black page. An abbe is introduced to two children he's going to tutor. The print is dedicated to the laudable association of anti-Gallicans. The Anti-Gallican Society was a middle-class dining club who awarded annual prizes for examples of excellent British craftsmanship and needlework. On 18th of November, during the final destructive riot at Drury Lane Theatre, people sang the patriotic ballet, The Roast Beef of Old England. In this, a lady's maid complains that her mistress is adopting French tastes, including French dancing. Here are the first two verses. When mighty roast beef was the Englishman's food, it ennobled our veins and enriched our blood. Our soldiers were brave and our courtiers were good. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. But since we have learned from all vaporing France to eat their ragout as well as to dance, we're fed up with nothing but vain complaisance. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. The Roast Beef of Old England is, of course, the subtitle of an explicitly anti-French painting, The Gates of Calais, by Hogarth. Hogarth and Garrick were both members of an artist's dining club, the Sublime Society of Beefsteaks, at whose regular meetings members celebrated English beef and liberty. 
a member of both clubs, was the populist anti-establishment pamphleteer and politician John Wilkes. Hogarth's 1763 caricature of Wilkes includes a liberty bonnet. One could easily imagine Wilkes in the pit, mischievously shouting, no French dancers. British liberty here referred to the Magna Carta, habeas corpus and trial by jury. In the 18th century, liberty also meant calls for freedom of the press and freedom of election. Catherine Macaulay argued that this was a continuation of an age-old Saxon struggle against the Norman yoke. The Normans, of course, were French. Linda Colley has summarised anti-French feeling among middle-class Londoners at the time. Quote, as long as British patricians spoke French among themselves, as long as they favoured French clothes, employed French hairdressers and valets, and haunted Parisian salons on the Grand Tour, as long as the taste for French cultural and luxury imports was allowed to put native artists, traders and manufacturers out of business, national distinction would be eroded and national fibre relaxed." Unquote. All of this shows that the objections to Nevers Ballet were part of a much wider set of attitudes among middle-class Londoners of patriotic disposition. A letter from an anonymous Englishman in the January 1756 issue of Tobias Smollett's The Critical Review took the side of the pro-ballet nobility. Denouncing the headstrong mob who had shouted no French dancers, the letter writer notes that, quote, the fashionable people who are not subject to those ridiculous national prejudices espouse the cause of the dancers, resolve to patronise the excellent composer, that's Nevers, and to support the entertainment. A letter in French, published in the December 1755 issue of Journal Étranger, gives the most detailed account of events, also taking sides with the nobles. It calls the protesters a cabal and uses the English word blackguards. It states that the nobles came on Wednesday the 12th November for the second performance of the ballet, prepared with swords and bludgeons, following the disturbances on the previous Saturday. When people in the pit began to whistle at the ballet, nobles jumped down into it from their boxes and began beating people. Their female companions helped by pointing to protesters, but, the writer says, many innocent people were hurt. When the ballet performance resumed, there were victorious cries from the nobles of Huzar. On Thursday the 13th, during the ballet, whistling came this time from the upper circle. So the nobles went up there and set about protesters, throwing one of them down the flight of stairs. On Monday the 17th, the ballet having been cancelled in their absence, the nobles interrupted the fifth act of a tragedy to demand the ballet be performed. This led to a lengthy argument, which concluded with a promise that it would be performed the following evening this final performance ending with a stage invasion and the scenery being smashed. The French account, which Derek Lyman suggests may have been written by Nevers himself, actually reveals how provocative the nobles were. It was they who physically attacked the spectators, not the other way round. The French account ends by saying that if the nobles and honest gentlemen had been less heated, all might have passed calmly, tranquillement, though who the honest gentlemen were is not quite clear. The anonymous Englishman in the Critical Review came to the hyperbolic conclusion that had it not been for the management's prudent withdrawal of the ballet, quote, we were upon the eve of a civil war which indeed was thought inevitable and sure an affair so serious was never before produced from such a comical subject. From a 21st century point of view, it was class war, uh, or culture war, rather than civil war, that was being acted out uh, on the floor of the theatre. At issue were questions about authentic British identity, this being defined through confrontation. And though the confrontation would shortly become another major war with France, in the theatre it was taking place between 
patriotic members of the middle class and, and those who, in their opinion, were the unpatriotic upper, upper classes. Conflict about who had the right to dictate what was or was not performed at the theatre was a conscious middle class challenge to aristocratic taste that can be seen as part of a wider political campaign aimed at transforming the social distribution of power. The anonymous Englishman in the Critical Review writes that among the great number of English dancers in the Chinese festival, there happen to be a few French. Might the protesters have been disguising their disapproval of aristocratic behaviour with patriotic rhetoric? Were they, in Samuel Johnson's terms, using patriotism as the last refuge of the scoundrel? It is suggested that Johnson was thinking of John Wilkes when he said this. Many American colonists closely followed news of John Wilkes's struggles with the British establishment. Catherine Macaulay found many readers in the American colonies and was warmly received there when she visited in 1784-85. The playful middle-class call for beef and liberty became a serious political reality on that side of the Atlantic when the Declaration of Independence called for life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I've been arguing that the ballet created more than just, as Peter Kitson put it, a fancy world of, of decorative Rococo whimsy. By accident rather than design, became a lightning rod for enlightened political aspirations. Thank you for watching.